Welcome to Focus on Why. I'm Amy Rowlandson, your host. Join me to explore the compelling stories, profound insights, and captivating experiences shared by my guests from all over the world. Focusing on the importance of why these relatable, uplifting, and inspiring conversations will empower, motivate, and guide you to create your own purposeful way of life. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we start, have you signed up to receive my weekly email newsletter, Friday Focus? Every Friday, I focus on one topic with one action arising. The link to sign up is in the show notes. Today on Focus on Why, I am joined by Jen LaMarinelle. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, it's such a pleasure. It's so lovely to have you finally here. So Jen, let's just kick this off. What is it you're focusing on at the moment? I am focusing mainly on what's happening this month. Uh, September is a really busy month in all things wild um, and also looking ahead to next year. Uh, a lot of the work I do, um, certainly with my sort of seasonal programs, is very seasonal. So I've got to be looking ahead to get dates in the dire and things like that. But yeah, immediately I... Um, I've got a couple of workshops that I'm running on, working with uh, helping people understand their nervous system, actually, and, and how that can help us thrive in our daily life. And then I've got a couple of retreats coming up. Um, one's like a one day retreat in the woods for uh, women who are, are new to my work. And then one is um, the autumn retreat for my Be Wild women. So women on my year long program. And we're heading down to Cornwall to do some coastal foraging uh, and hang out with wolves for the day. So, um, yeah, lots of exciting things happening in September. It's uh, it's a beautiful time of year and such a gorgeous time to be out in the wild. So it's a busy time of year for me. So all things wild and you talked about seasonal work. So if someone happens to be listening to this in a different season, why don't you walk us through the season so that there's something applicable for whenever this is being listened to? Yeah, beautiful. Um so there's something happening in every season, right? And uh, my work tends to be um, based on the wheel of the year. And the wheel of the year, you know, traditionally we think of all the months, right? January, February, March, April, blah, 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 or spring, summer, autumn, winter. Um, but you can actually break up the wheel of the year into lots of different spokes. Now, a lot of people think of like the solstices, summer solstice, winter solstice, and the equinoxes, spring and autumn equinoxes. Um, but there's something going on at each of those different parts of the year. So people might have heard of Beltane or Imbolc or Sawain, um, Halloween um, and Lamas. And each of those points of the year has something different going on, both in terms of what's happening when you're looking outside, but also what's going on internally. Like we are... Um, seasonal cyclical beings uh, we've lived in tune with the seasons and cycles for millennia right at m millions of years um, our ancestors and that's still inside of us right so I'm a big believer that no matter what's going on in our lives if we look outside to what's happening out there um, you know what the season is we can understand a lot more what's going on inside so for example if you're listening to this um, at the onset of winter you might find that your energy is drawing much more inwards that you feel the urge to slow down to eat richer foods to kind of um, replenish your energy and rest more which can be really almost ca not counterintuitive because it, it, it is intuitive to do that, but our society and our, our cultures don't really allow for that. For example, in winter, like it's it's one of the lightest, brightest, busiest times of year, right? Um, so we can often feel at odds with that. And then the opposite can be said of spring and summer when we're starting to emerge from winter, particularly if we've rested well, we're emerging with that energy of um the wood energy of spring, you know, the upward rising of the sap. Um, however, a lot of us haven't rested effectively over winter. So it comes to spring and then into summer and we're exhausted going into a, a time which would naturally um, have us feeling more energized and out there in the world. So yeah, there's there's real power to be had in, in honoring our wildness and our natural state of being and how that can really clash with the modern day world we live in. 
Now, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a yeah. little second. Love what it. happens if you live in a climate that doesn't have such marked seasons Ooh. from that internal perspective? Yeah, I love that question. Um, having never lived anywhere that doesn't have the seasons, I don't have a lived example of this, but most most places have some sort of seasonal variation. Um, but there are some places, for example, you know, closer to the equator and stuff that... Um, that it doesn't vary so much. I think there's a lot here in terms of what is our um, our ethnic heritage and and you know what we are used to in our more recent kind of history. Um, but I'd be intrigued to know actually, like you know, what's the impact for me? I love the seasons because it really kind of marks the turning of the year, and and certainly women I've worked with and people I've worked with who are have sort of slowed down and really noticed and marked the changing of the seasons, they have noticed that it's kind of almost created more space because they're noticing the passing of the year rather than just whizzing by. I could imagine, and I would love to hear from you know any listeners that that experience no no real seasons. You know where do the marker points come from? And my suspicion, and this is like I've never actually been asked this before, so this is great, thank you. But my my suspicion is that um, in many oh gosh, we could go very deep here very quickly, but in many. Um, Many uh, humans live in places with seasons because there is um, our hunter-gatherer nature has relied on seasons and we've had to work very closely with them. You know, we have seasons of plenty and then we gather and we store and we hi hibernate. Well, we don't actually hibernate, but, you know, we, we go into a hibernation type state um, and we follow those. There are obviously populations that live much close to the, the equator when there's not so much um, seasonal variation. They actually have a very different lifestyle to us. So I've been hugely lucky to spend a lot of time with the San Bushmen in the Kalahari um, in the desert. Now, they do have a rainy season, but it doesn't always come. So um, they don't have as much seasonality as we do. However, the plants and animals have adapted to that so actually food is available all year round so they don't have to um live quite as closely with the seasons because they don't have to think ahead to store up um store for the winter and then you know make do until they can get something else they live what's called a um oh gosh i think it's uh immediate return yeah an immediate return lifestyle which is basically everything's there they've just got to go and get it but then it's there and all they need to do is live in the moment day by day pretty much so i think if we have grown up with that and it's in our ethnic background for centuries we're probably used to that and maybe we don't get as affected by the seasons if we're used to seasons and then go and move somewhere which doesn't have them I suspect in some sense we would miss them because we're if we haven't grown up in that um in the ability to live day by day which most people in the modern world you know we have to think and plan ahead right i suspect we we haven't you know people living in the seasons um in places where there aren't seasons won't have quite so much ability to regulate their own cycles potentially like when it's winter, for those of us that get winter, we might bemoan it, but we also kind of wrap up in the cozy jumpers and we don't feel too bad if we snuggle up with a movie on a sofa on a winter's night or get, you know, go to bed earlier because it's darker. We naturally feel the urge to rest. I wonder whether people living in places without seasons um, don't get that more natural inclination and yet their bodies are still programmed to want it. Does that make sense? It does. And as you said, it's a day to day and a day by day living for the moment. So instead of having to plan on a seasons basis, they're planning on a daily basis. So they still have the 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 cyclical, but it's a very short time frame mm. and, and it's a, it's on repeat and it's probably easier to manage i don't know but this is this is something that we're both going to have to do some research on yes. a bit more to find out because i what i tend to do is i have these reflections and then i go off and do the re research and it, it, it becomes, uh, comes my action so reflection with action for me mm -hmm. is to go off and find out about what yeah. happens in this env environment 
So let's stick with what you do know, Jen, and, and really dive deeper into that element. You talked just then about the hunter-gatherer nature and about the the plenty and the abundance that comes in in various points throughout the year. And then there's also it, the opposite of that. There's a scarcity. Mm. Now, without drawing a line of some people have a scarcity abund or abundant mindset, they have mm. one or the other. Is it because of this? Is it because of this hunter gatherer and the panic of, oh, I don't think the things are going to go well, or I don't know. You tell me. Oh, great question. I mean, any reaction we have tends to be so it tends to be down to something in our evolution, right? And yes, we can train our mindset and things like that. And it's super powerful. I mean, I'm a coach. I love working on mindset, right? And um, a lot of the work I do looks at what's going on at an autonomic level. So our unconscious involuntary um, level. So, you know, at our nervous system level. And a lot of our immediate responses, behaviors, um, thought patterns come from our perception of safety, or, or actually it's our neuroception of safety, sort of what's below our cognitive level of thinking, um, how safe do we feel in our, um, and, and that's common to all animals, right? You know, our sympathetic nervous system gets aroused, it's our fight or flight response. If there's a threat, if there's any perceived danger, we go into kind of an aroused sympathetic nervous system state. You know, our body's filled with um, adrenaline, we're ready to go. And now that is a survival strategy and a really, really important one, right? Um, whether you're a predator out there trying to, you know, hunt your prey or whether you're a prey animal being chased and humans were both, right? Um, that, that system comes in to help us survive. Now, what's interesting with humans is we have an extra level above, um, uh, um, neuroception, which is perception, and that's our cognitive thinking kicks in and we make stories. You know, humans are, are meaning making animals, right? So if we have a message from our autonomic nervous system that's danger, we will make a, a, a story about that, usually based on what's happened to us in the past, right? So we're layering our own um, experiences with uh, what's a very animalistic reaction that's come from evolution. So we are kind of primed to be on high alert, get anxious and things like that. The challenge is our modern day world isn't the same as the world we would have lived in when all of these systems developed, right? They developed, you know, 400 million years ago, 200 million years ago. And so we're dealing with the same responses to oh, there's a tiger got to run um as you know an email coming in and saying um i've gotten a complaint or something like that right so it, it's really helpful to understand that is our animal body right um and when we can learn to work with that, um, so if you've ever um, done any work on polyvagal theory, it is amazing. Everyone should understand a basic level of polyvagal theory. Um, it's very, very cool because that explains how we can then work with our nervous system to get up into a more parasympathetic state. Um, and that's the rest and digest. That's when we've got this outlook of possibility and hope and creativity. It's when we can connect. It's when we can um, read social cues. It's, it's kind of... Um, it, it's the safety, I am safe kind of place. So whilst we layer on our cognitive beliefs and stories and values and all of that, often what's going on at a, an, an automatic um, nervous system level is what determines um, our mindset. The great thing as humans is if we can then learn to work with our mindset and work on our mindset and manage our mind, we can often change some of what's going on like physiologically as well. Um, and that's super powerful. And and that's, for me, is kind of like, how do we embrace our wildness? Like what's actually going on in our animal bodies and what environment are we supposed to be living and working in? And then use that to thrive in the realities of the modern day world that we live in that is not designed to support that. However, with our, the power of our cognition and mindset, we can work with that. 
And I totally hear what you're saying. And it is so important to understand that when we are focusing our attention on something outside of ourselves, that's when we can actually live with purpose because other, we're not in the threat state. We're not, we're able to do that. So all of, all of what you've just said totally leads me into what is it that is driving you to create this incredible world of embracing your wildness? Oh, it's a great question. I, and, and there are multiple threads to the answer as well. One is my backstory. You know, I, I um, was in corporate financial services, climbing the shiny career ladder and had a very successful, promising career ahead of me. I kind of was doing everything I should be doing, um, everything that was expected of me. I was very respectable, um, earned a good salary and you know, everything looked perfect from the outside, but on the inside, I was miserable, <laughs> you know, and I was just, you know, in, I was late twenties and I was just disappearing into a shell. Um, and I often describe it as feeling like I was trapped in a beautiful cage. But what was interesting was that it was a cage that I'd built myself based on other people's expectations, their hopes, their fears, you know, all of that. And I was, it's going to sound strange, but I was lucky that I had a bit of a breakdown. Uh, it wasn't pleasant at the time, but I, it enabled me, it was kind of hitting rock bottom that enabled me to work. Um, I worked with a, a counselor and a coach and she really helped me see that I wasn't stuck. And through working with her and then, I mean, it's been a long journey since that was like eight years ago or something now. Um, I realized more and more like who I was and that was really what I'd been missing through everything else. I'd been leading my life for other people pretty much because I had no idea who I was or that I could actually be who I wanted to be. And that's really driven me to what I do now. I mean, I've always had a love of nature. So selfishly, I wanted to bring nature into my work, right? When I left corporate, I was like, right, um, what do I want to be doing? I want to be out in nature and I want to be helping people. So um, I did a big, long walk, uh, took some time out, had a big, long walk. And that, um, so basically I was walking for three and a half months. And through that process, I really came to understand even more how powerful A, being out in nature was, B, how powerful that walking and being nomadic and being self-reliant was, not just for me and my belief in what I could do, but also this real sense of this is what we are supposed to be doing. This is how humans are supposed to be living. Um, you know, we were nomadic, we would be outside all day we'd be connecting with other people and getting support from other people we were physical we're moving um and at the slow pace you know all i had to do every day was work out where i was sleeping um or where you know where i'd pitch my tent what i was eating and you know how to get from a to b and yes i was blogging and you know raising money at the same time but it was really simple and i thrived <laughs> So that's really fed into my purpose is I love helping people, um, particularly those with a similar story to me that were just feeling completely lost, didn't know how they'd got to where they were going or how on earth it could be any different, um, and were feeling trapped. And I really wanted people to know that they were stronger than they knew they were. They were capable of way more than they think they were. Um, and that being out in nature does something for us that is super powerful at a soul level um and you know going on eight years now i'm understanding more and more more about what that is and it's that you know scientifically it's proven our nervous systems calm when we're out in nature um and my belief is that's because it's where we're supposed to be you know as i said before so my passion is then how do we take that n that knowing that wisdom so the wisdom of the cycle of the year um the wisdom of our nervous system the wisdom of the wild and take that into our daily lives so it's not about running away and living in caves again but it's how do we bring 
our natural wildness into our everyday lives. And wild is a word that keeps coming up. And how do you define wild? It's a question I often put back to my clients, actually, because it's different for everybody. Um, a lot of people, when they think of wild, they first go to often the negative connotations of um, out of control, of dangerous, of, um, you know, chaotic. Uh, but when we get, and that's due to a lot of conditioning and, and, and fears we have as a society, right? And fairy stories of the big dark woods and, and, and often very real experiences as well. But when people start thinking, well, what is wild? And I often talk about the wild woman archetype or the wild hunter archetype. And it's like, well, what are, what are their qualities? Um, because yes, there's, there's the wild as in the wild out there, you know, trees, forests, um, lakes, mountains, you know, it's majestic and wild and powerful, but it's when we think of the wild people, the wild archetypes, you start coming up with courageous, strong, powerful, grounded, intuitive, resilient, resourceful, um, fearless, uh, you know, interconnected, um, serene, strong, um, all of those. And when people come up with those characteristics, there are often little glimmers of resonance it's like, oh, yeah, because it's like all of those characteristics we have in us somewhere because we are wild, right? Uh, but we've been tamed or we've tamed ourselves because of our circumstances, our situations. So wildness basically is kind of anything that really feels authentic and true and um, almost animalistic and, and embodied rather than... Uh, a lot of the different characteristics that are often sort of um, tended and nurtured in schools and education and in employment and things. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because my immediate thought of when you, you're saying the word wild, I go to anything that happens without human intervention. Oh. So otherwise it then becomes something that we have crafted changed altered from uh -huh. its natural state i don't know if that makes any sense but i i believe we are part of nature and i and i think you are t you do too we're part yeah. of the natural world we we can't be separated we can't be anything but so where does that if we are part of it and then i've just said it's what happens regardless of whether we have a human interaction we are obviously changing the natural world in our very way of of cohabiting of being here but also likewise i know that the trees have got their own plans that they they are going to be doing things around the year without me having any intervention outside with them so yeah i don't know i think the wild actually is on your doorstep it's not necessarily you know, something that can be, as you said, the fairy tale forest that you can't break through. Yeah, I love that definition of wild, actually. And it is so true. And and I think that's often why it can be intimidating and feel dangerous to people, because it's something we literally cannot control. I love this if I go to the sea um, on a stormy day and you just get the sense of the power of the waves. And it's like there's nothing we can do to control that. Like it's kind of the one force that that humans haven't managed to break right or change or control and that can be very very intimidating to a species that survives by controlling everything right but yeah nature's everywhere the wild is everywhere so i look out of my window i'm very lucky i live on the edge of a small town and there's countryside so i, I look out and there's trees but even in in the the little front yard outside there's weeds pushing up through the cracks and things and like that's the wild or the, the bees or the butterflies or the birds. Um, you can find it anywhere. And then I'd say, you know, the wild is also inside. Just so many of us have become disconnected from it um, because we've been disconnected often from the wild outside, particularly if we live in cities or, or, you know, very built up places or for whatever reason, we don't get out there because of fears of safety or confidence or um, the weather or, you know, whatever it is. So yeah, we have become disconnected. Um, yeah. So having come back down that shiny ladder that you were climbing and now 
taking yourself off on these incredible journeys and, and walking around the world, essentially, but actually just embracing this wisdom. What is it that you want to pass on and leave as your own legacy in this way? I would love people just to fall in love with nature <laughs> um, and in doing so, fall in love with themselves again as well. I know that sounds a little cliche, but there's there's an adage that says people won't love what they don't understand and they won't save what they don't love. And if I can just help a few more people feel safer and happier and in love with nature and understanding how important nature is for us like not and i'm not even talking on a, a global climate change scale although obviously that's really important and, and pressing right now but even just on a local level if people could fall in love with nature and start growing a, a bit more in their gardens and and rather than tarmacking them over keep the grass and build a pond um and if everybody could simply understand more that that the wild isn't out there and separate like we like you say we are part of nature and it can really deeply support us and heal us and i believe when we can tap into that we then live and work better together as well like through working with nature we can understand uh, understand ourselves better and therefore work with each other better and i think the world would be a happier place if we all could do that I know it sounds overly simplified, perhaps, but I really do believe it's possible. I, I do too. I absolutely. And you, your catalyst was the breakdown that you said you were lucky to have. Obviously, it wasn't pleasant at the time, you said. But knowing that that was a catalyst and that for you, because it was so incongruent to what you wanted and what you felt. Was there a time at any point before that in your life where you were at one with nature? As a child, definitely. I was, and, and I know this will ring true for a lot of people because it's, <laughs> the, the clue is usually there in childhood, right? And so I'd be in the garden with my dad, you know, eating the peas from the pods and I'd be out roaming the fields with my friends and climbing trees and building dens and staying out, you know, until the bell rang for supper or something. Um, I'd camp in the garden and go for midnight walks and, you know, um, and I was very lucky, you know, I got, I um, got to do horse riding when I was younger and I was a member of a guides group that did a lot of camping and outdoorsy stuff. So, and I was just always happiest out there. Like there's photos of me as a child, like, you know, in the sea or um, picking daisies or, you know, whatever. And, it just felt normal, right? That was just what we did. And it was where I was happiest. Um, and it was only kind of sort of in my my late 20s that I rediscovered that again. It's true. The clues are there. And and this is this is so it's so strange that how you spend your time and, and I write about it in my book and saying about what are the things that you did as a child? Yeah. And, and I, I also caveat that, you know, you don't need to be on your bike chasing people around the neighborhood like in, <laughs> in your 40s or 50s just to reclaim that childhood. Although I'm not stopping you if that's what you want to do <laughs> or climbing trees or whatever it is. But as you said, I was also that child that was out till whatever time we would go out in the morning. We had no touch base at all during the day you were off the whole day on your bikes you'd taken something yeah. to eat for lunch and then you come back just in time for dinner and things like that and yeah that freedom and I think that's the sense also that you get of exploration and freedom and curiosity and those are key for for me but I'm, I'm wondering what is it for you that your core values are that are reflective in your work as well mm. It's interesting. I've actually been looking at revisiting what are my values because I used to have some that were very, uh, very kind of basic. It was sort of around um, courage and curiosity and compassion. And I, um, I was looking at these. Yeah. And I was like, what are they now? And it's, I haven't quite nailed them down, but it's around the sense of being really 
honest and truth seeking um like this ability to be vulnerable uh with myself and with others to really question you know what's going on for me and for others um and to always keep exploring like the, there's always something more to be understood or learned um so staying humble you know and and knowing that there's always something more um we can always learn something from someone else or from our own responses to something um but <laughs> there's definitely an element of practicing what I preach like sometimes it's very easy to be suggesting ideas it's like hang on you know when did I last do that for myself so really like constantly checking in with myself and then also what I've been exploring recently is also um, how this all links to leadership and what does it mean to be an authentic leader um, you know whilst it's it's me in my business I work with many people I have assistants that help me on retreats and programs and things and it's like but I'm leading my clients out in the wild it's like what does it mean to be a good leader and how can we take all of our experiences and and everything that's happening in a group before us and actually be a good leader like it's something i'm sort of still in the early days of really exploring but um yeah being authentic being vulnerable um taking the lead uh also looking at different styles of leadership like collaborative leadership and things like that um and i think i've forgotten your original question <laughs> it's fine I, I you were exploring your your new values and yeah. your, you've been going through this truth seeking questioning period and and mm -hmm. that's something that is welcomed by me at all stages and transitions and of life because it's just understanding is this really who I am at mm -hmm. this point in time and and it seems to be that you know you're going through that phase and and it is so important to understand that as we take on board different experiences we do adapt we do evolve we do shift and change and so does our purpose so does our our why in terms of it gets tweaked you know it gets yeah. moved along depending on what really matters to us and what what we're reflecting from the outside world and what I've heard throughout this conversation with you Jen is this wisdom this honoring this connectedness, mm. this evolution and collaboration. So those are those have been the words that I've heard in your conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there was a particular question associated no, with that. Not but... at all. It was just to re <laughs> just reflect on on those particular words. Yeah. Of, you know, wisdom, honoring, connectedness, evolution, humility, and collaboration. Yeah, it really speaks to me of of kind of the, the way of the village and going back to it, like in indigenous people, right? And we all, I'm, I'm very lucky that I have spent time, you know, with truly indigenous folk in the Kalahari, but we all have our own indigenous roots. And in most indigenous cultures we see, and in most communities these days that I see that work well, they have those values right and we think of the village we, you know most of us know the phrase it takes a village to raise a child right well <laughs> i often say this on my retreats but it takes a village to run a village um we were never supposed to do everything ourselves and be good at everything you know that's where superwoman comes right um we're supposed to lean into the support of each other we're supposed to connect with each other um humans are not solo um solo creatures right we're not supposed to do it alone and you know sadly i think a lot of that has been lost because we do live very isolated lives um especially with the advent of technology like i love technology you know it's amazing we wouldn't be having this conversation right without technology and yet we rely on it to the extent that we're off we we sever a lot of the connections that physiologically and psychologically we really need so that in-person connection and, and going back to nervous system stuff again we're supposed to be around people to help us co-regulate as well as self-regulate and somehow somewhere along the line we've kind of developed a sense of shame around that and a sense of pride if we're able to do things independently 
it's like we're not supposed to like no um <laughs> there's some stats somewhere about no um person today could actually survive as a hunter gatherer on their own uh to bring in enough food and everything and to be able to make enough shelter you you have to be in a group that's working collaboratively um and that is not easy uh but it brings many many benefits in but um, yeah, that involves listening to the wisdom of people who are experienced or experts in a particular thing, uh, leaning into the support of others and recognizing, you know, you don't have to be good at everything, but um, leaning into that strength of a village can really re be very supportive. And talking about leaning in, I'm sure there are people who are listening right now going, I want to hear more about what Jen does. <laughs> so <laughs> tell, tell me, Jen, or tell, tell the listener, how can they reach out and connect with you? What's the best way? So uh, the best the best way is find me on Facebook. So I'm Jen LaMarinelle, Wildfire Walks on Facebook. That's where I'm most active, kind of sharing stuff from my own adventures as well as tips and things. Um, LinkedIn as well, if you prefer the, the slightly more professional platform, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. And then my website is uh, www.wildfirewalks.com. And that's got all the information about different ways to work for me. It's got like free seasonal meditations on there. Uh, um, information about my coaching, my programs, my retreats. So yeah, if people want to know more, they can uh, can look me up, stalk me. <laughs> I'm sure they will. And yes, my goodness, Jen, what a beautiful conversation we've had. Thank you so much for sharing your why and your purpose and the work that you're focusing on now and have got planned for the months, years to come. It really does sound incredible and yeah, I've got so many different avenues that I will be picking up in my reflections episode. I just don't know where to start, to be honest. But I'm sure when I listen back to it myself, something will rise to the top as it often does. So thank you. Thank you so much. Do you have some final words? I would just say, remember that you are a wild being. And when we remember that and honour it and embrace all the the benefits and challenges that brings we can understand ourselves and other people a lot better so yeah just stay wild what value have you gained from tuning into focus on why today what are your reflections with actions i'd love to hear your thoughts please leave a review on apple Podcasts or via linkedin and share how focus on why has made a difference to you your feedback not only will inspire others, but will help them to discover how Focus on Why has created powerful ripple effects. Let's continue the conversation. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or X. Join the Focus on Why Facebook group and sign up for my weekly newsletter, Friday Focus, to keep in touch. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, Focus on Why. <laughs>